So, um, Vimam, you've had a very boring week or two. <clears throat> yeah. And your career and, and tech is boring at the moment. There's nothing happening. Anyways, slow yeah. news cycle, so this is going to be a painful conversation for us. We'll have slug. nothing we'll, to talk we, about. We apologize in advance. It's going to be a bit of a slog. <laughs> Um, and one of the things that I think I'd like to start with, we are in the Institute of Engineering and Technology, but neither of us are engineers. Can we legitimately claim to be here? Can you work in tech if you haven't trained as a mathematician or an engineer? I mean, I suppose the current situation at Twitter <laughs> uh, kind of tells us the answer to that question, Stephanie, right? So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what's happening at Twitter? <laughs> Maybe. Um, and thank goodness if you are, bless, and, and I hope you're having a lovely, peaceful existence. Um, Elon has decided that unless you are a, quote, hardcore engineer, uh, the, the uh, qualifications of which he determines based on, who knows what, your, your ability to sleep on the floor in an office, uh, you are not qualified to work at Twitter. So last Friday, about 50% of the company was laid off, including just about everybody who works on content moderation, machine learning ethics, human rights, conversational health, all of us gone. Um, and not just all of us, but also people who do very critical things on the website, like maintain our testing platform. Apparently there's only two people left to maintain our entire testing platform. So just in scale of context, Twitter has hundreds, plural, of machine learning models, all of which are kind of run through tests to see how they perform on certain metrics before production and also sometimes during, just to continue. So that was two people. Um, so the, t the team I was on was called Cortex, which is the machine learning core of the company, had 2,000 people. I think now it's like less than 200, so that's fun. Um, but to answer your question, um, I mean, non-flippantly, absolutely, right? Because what we are seeing real time is you know, a, a comedy occurring on Twitter in real time, but it is because people without an understanding of how technology impacts society, how humans work, human nature and human behavior, um, unless you have those people at a company, you don't have people who really understand like, hey, if we just ha let everybody pay $8 to have a check mark, then, you know, we have all sorts of unverified accounts. Um, People claiming to be, I think the biggest thing has been there, uh, people, somebody was claiming to be Eli Lilly, the insulin producer, and tweeted that they were making insulin free, leading to what, like billions of dollars of revenue loss because their stock price is tanked. Yeah. So I should sincerely hope that we should be in this room. I mean, what could go wrong? Yeah. It's fine. Um, and I think that question of what could go wrong is a very human question. And there's an argument that people who are trained in the liberal arts and humanities bring a different perspective on that than people who might be trained in hard sciences. And I don't say that to um, stir anything up, but just to bring us together. Um, because oftentimes in our education, particularly mm -hmm. depending on the country you're educated in, you can be separated from those subjects in a way that to me often feels false. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if we could talk a bit about your background because I was checking you out on LinkedIn, obviously, uh, ahead of this talk to do my research, and noticed that you mix and marry the qualitative and the quantitative in a really interesting way. And that formation led you to have this career that has brought you to this moment. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if you could just, for people who haven't LinkedIn stalked you, talk mm -hmm. us through that journey and how you, how you see that back and forth dialogue. Yeah, um, so I'm a quantitative social scientist by background. Um, my I went to MIT as an undergrad and I did this weird thing like major in political science. Um, but m just about every degree at MIT is quantitative, so I learned my first programming language was actually MATLAB. Um, so I started with MATLAB, then moved to Stata, R, Python. So I do find it really hilarious when you know tech bros think that I don't know how to program because I actually know more programming languages than they do. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the fascinating thing and the thing that brought me to tech, I always say I was not born of tech. I graduated MIT and instead of going into investment banking like any sensible person did in, in 2002, I like decided to be really poor for a while <laughs> and go work in public policy and nonprofits, um, which I loved, but I kept getting frustrated because I had learned all of these ways of harnessing the power of data 
to understand human nature and human behavior. And what I really wanted to do is use those insights to help improve the world. So I kept dancing back and forth between nonprofits, which at that time, you know, were still very qualitative. I'm like, but there's all this data. Uh, and then on the other end, for-profit institutions, um, you know, for a minute I worked at, at a, a, a basically a, st a stats company, um, which I felt didn't have soul. And so I kept going back and forth and then and I was in my grad program um, at UCSD in, in around 2001, and I heard about this job called data science. And I'm like, that's it. That's the thing I want to do. And again, like, this, is very, this is a very naive Ramon at that time, right? So I was like, well, you know, all I knew about tech was the, the outsider's perspective. And, you know, if, if you all were not the age of, like, six or whatever at that time, at that time it was still the, like, um, genius in the hoodie, you know, tech startup founder, changing the world, disruption, disruption, right? And, uh, you know, again, I had the outsider's perspective. Um, so I went to tech and, and I really thought what my mission was as a data scientist was to understand human nature and human behavior to make products at scale that improve people's lives. And then I went to Silicon Valley. <laughs> But you also founded your own company first. And I remember, because it was on Twitter that you came to my consciousness, uh, you popped up on my timeline. There was an article, I think it was in the New York Times, correct me if I'm wrong, where you were effectively erased from the story of founding your own company. That is entirely true. Um, so just to maybe like kind of walk a little bit through the, the chronology, I started in the field of responsible AI in 2017. Um, I always joke that if, if Accenture knew what a big field it would have become, they would have never hired me. I mean, I, I was an absolute nobody. I was teaching data science. Um, and what I, what I was doing in 2016 was giving talks on quantitative methods and statistics and how they can be misleading. Mm. Um, and I want to believe that it was one of those talks that Accenture is like, oh, you know, she can go on stage and not make a fool of herself. So, um, so I got this fancy title um, and basically no direction and was told, make something of this. So Accenture was an amazing, amazing four years. I loved my time there. Um, but then I left and started my own company. But yeah, you know, um, I, I was Aqua hired over into Twitter, not to get too much into tech jargon, but essentially they, my tw Twitter acquired me, has an IP license to my company, which is called Parity, but I got to keep the company. And I wanted to do that because I thought it was critically important for the startup community to flourish. Um, we need more than just big tech companies making change, et cetera. Um, and I, it was very important to me that especially the field of responsible AI flourish. Um, but yes, and then what followed was a New York Times article that centered only the woman I put in charge and referred to me as a researcher who made a tool, which, that, which is like now my Twitter buy. I thought it was hilarious, to be honest. It was, it was really funny. So just to be like... And it wasn't even like up top, it was like the second to last paragraph and it was just one line and it was like, Parity was founded by Ramon Chowdhury who was a researcher who made a tool. Um, so that's just become kind of a running gag on my, my former team as well. So. I loved it um, because so many people piled in and were reacting to it. And I think there's a couple of things to pull from that. One of which is when we think of who a founder is, or who a technologist is, or what it even means to work in technology, you've raised this sort of caricature of the guy in the hoodie mm -hmm. who's coding, and maybe he's a Trekkie, I mean, reads I'm lots of sci-fi. So. Yeah, that, so that, like, that there's all these markers that can make it where it's like, that's what somebody who works in tech looks like, or that's mm -hmm. what a founder looks like. And then what do we mean by a researcher? And I get this as a professional researcher as well. I've had people be like, oh, researcher sounds really low status. You should call yourself a consultant. And I'm like, dude, researchers are like killed for their work. Yeah. You know, researchers are dangerous. They're subversive. I don't consider this a low status job. I consider this very honorable, but that might be from the, right. the PhD path as well. Of like, I'm after truth. And it's, <laughs> you know, and this idea of who's an expert, who's a leader. And we have these pictures in our mind and I, I loved that. And I also loved that, that theme that you just mentioned earlier as well of like the outsider status and what mm -hmm. that has allowed you to see, because that again is key in so much of research. If you are part of the insider group, if you, you, there's a risk of monoculture, groupthink, mm -hmm. et cetera, the costs of which we see all the time on the front pages of the Financial Times and we're seeing it today with the world of crypto. If you don't get people to question 
and say the emperor has no clothes on, or I actually see this from a totally different discipline and there are risks here, that, that's a problem. So I'm intrigued as to how do you see the strengths of being an outsider, or would you even say you're an outsider? Are you in fact redefining what it means to be an insider? Right, um, I don't know how to answer that question, but I, I will say this, I think what's really dangerous is the assumption that all of the things that you and I are trained in the, the non-quantitative aspects are easy or they're soft or they're more simple. Yeah. And you know what, it's actually worth, like you're, you're mentioning the world of crypto. The world of crypto is like generally full of people who sort of read the Cliff's Notes of political philosophy and they're like, got it, you know, <laughs> the market, Plato, love him, <laughs> you know? And, and I think it was literally Sam Bankman fried who said, I don't understand books. Like you, you've wasted your time if you've read a book. That Anything hurt that's me, a book by the way, having just post. written a book. Right. I was like, what? And, and, and like, it could be a blog said, post, the six like, paragraphs. It could be a blog post. I'm like, <laughs> can you imagine, right? Like any of these like researchers, these incredibly beautiful thinkers, these poetic authors as a blog post. Mm. But like this is like, this is like you know, how do we distill information to three bullet points and then walk off with it? And it's that naivete I will be generous and call it naivete mm. about the value of this work and what it means to technology that is quite literally leading to the real time implosion of all of these things. Like any of us who have ever studied markets understand what a Ponzi scheme is. Mm. Like trying to explain to a crypto person that all of this is a Ponzi scheme is near impossible if they do not understand what this means in a market, et cetera. Um, you know, and again, just so much of what we're seeing on Twitter with the lack of basic understanding of human nature, human behavior. I think the big thing folks were saying is that, you know, nobody in charge of Twitter seems to, un currently in charge of Twitter, seems to understand that this is not a technology platform. It is a platform that is based on networks, connectivity, and people. So as you mentioned, you know, you came across my profile on Twitter. I came across your, but there's so many people who are in this room today who I will consider good friends, and I only know them because of a social media platform. And it's, it's kind of sad to even think through what it means for this platform to be dying, which mm. is actually what's happening. And so I, I was reading this tweet this morning and it's actually, it was actually kind of sad. And somebody was saying that we are essentially watching Twitter die in real time, yeah. the technology and the community, right? So like it, literally things are breaking, like little things, you'll, you'll see like your, your comments won't refresh, you no longer see a number count of your notifications. You know, there's like little things on the tech breaking. And then there's just the community breakdown. Lots of people have left to other sites. Most people are going to Mastodon. Um, people are trying to find each other. It's, it's very profound. Mm. And it's almost like we're kind of digital refugees yeah. because we don't have a home because Twitter was our home for so long. It makes me wonder, um, and I'm interested if you can pull in your thoughts on the concept of responsible AI and responsible tech or ethical tech. Was there a phase because I remember it feeling quite optimistic and buzzy around like 2006 to about 2016 when you had like Brexit and the US presidential election and social media got really toxic. And then during the pandemic, it was just off the charts, mm -hmm. insane. Um, there was like an, an optimism and perhaps a naivete at the beginning and the tech bros were feted and it was like a really cool place to work. Mm -hmm. Suddenly in working in investment banking or management consultancy, I mean, they all left and went dating to myself, but you know, you, yeah, if you were forward thinking, you wanted to work in Silicon Valley, et cetera, it was really exciting. And now these companies really have like that, that kind of like stench of like, oh God, you know, they're big, they're bloated, mm -hmm. they are institutionalized, they have many of the same problems yeah. that any, you know, they've matured to the point that it's like, oh. they're fossilized. Yeah. So was that a phase perhaps? And what, what therefore will we see? What's going to be the next, I don't want to say like cool thing, but like the next optimistic thing, what's going to be fun? Like if you are somebody who wants to be working on, you know, this is a room full of people who I think are highly motivated. You're here. It's an ungodly hour. I'm listening to people talk on stage. Well done. <laughs> If you want to, you know, make the world a better place, save the world, or just, you know, hopefully make it like a less bad place might be the more realistic way of doing it. What do we build now? That's such a great question because I've been thinking about that a lot for very mm. obvious reasons. So two things. First, um, 
I was talking to Meg Mitchell about this. If you're unfamiliar with who Meg is, she was at Google and she was one of the folks on the ethical AI team who was fired. And she's currently um, chief ethics scientist at Hugging Face. And Meg has started to refer to the, the fangs of, again, tech jargon, you know, and actually fang is probably not even the appropriate the acronym anymore. So it, fang refers to Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, Google. F A A N G, but now like that shifts a lot because now Facebook, you know, doesn't really count on there, and people are always debating. Anyway, the point is, she's referred to those companies dinosaurs, um, and it's so interesting because, and again, I'm going to put my social scientist hat on. Um, we we saw in the 2000s, the 2010s, the professionalization of these companies where they stopped being like they still have the trappings of the foosball tables and the free kombucha and you know therapy fluffies but they're actually literally the same as mm -hmm. lehman brothers and goldman sachs like and, and the uh, how their treatment of ethics teams is really what brings that to the forefront right so it's not just twitter meta slash facebook just laid off eleven thousand people and a lot of those people were user experience researchers, social scientists, um, you know, so th clearly these companies have gotten to this point where they are, you know, strictly, they're, they're not even making pretenses about what their priorities are. Um, but what I am excited about, what I am seeing are companies like Hugging Face. Hugging Face is a really great example. There is now this third space of this sort of open source moving towards product. Um, and we're getting these, you know, these, these different organizations and companies that are rethinking this paradigm. And what particularly interests me about it is actually the open source and community aspect, right? So Hugging Face and in Meg's work and Sasha Lucioni and like her, they have an amazing team. They're actually like building in real time. They're actually showing how this stuff works, like the skunk works of it, right? Um, which is not actually something that the traditional tech companies have done, right? They go and they're behind the scenes and they hire their hardcore engineers and they go make their models and they go, here, I have built this for you. And some of these more open source, um, it's like this hybrid sort of open source for profit. They're trying to make things in the open, trying to do community engagement. Um, and that's actually what I've what I've been working on. I've, I've Last month, um, I kicked off a nonprofit on algorithmic bias bounties. So to rewind, last year my team at Twitter held the first algorithmic bias bounty. So what does that mean? Um, if you are familiar with the world of information security, bug bounty programs uh, release software and pay people for identifying issues with it. And we wanted to do the same for machine learning models. So, um, so if you remember last year, my team did an analysis of one of our models and understanding the bias. And we said, you know what? We know our analysis was incomplete because we will, we will by definition have a limited perspective, right? We have a limited network of people who can be hired in this job. I only had so many people I can hire. We want to open this up to the world and get feedback. And it was amazing the feedback we got. So a couple of colleagues and I actually started a nonprofit and we're running this challenge. And what we've realized is it is in that similar vein of what I, what I have been calling structured community feedback. How do we learn from people compensate them for their efforts and their labor, but also do it in a way that is built into how products are built. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, so we're seeing this shift away from these dinosaurs and these companies that do things in a very, very traditional manner, building a technology and then releasing it, to companies that are more interested in understanding how to curate human feedback and incorporate it into what they're building as they're building it. Hmm. One of the things that you were just saying about opening it up and mm -hmm. the fact that you had a, a bounty program, et cetera, speaks to, I think, a larger need in our society to help the general public understand technology mm -hmm. and to become part of it and also to cultivate our talent pipeline. So here in the UK, um, where we all are, obviously, but one of the things that I've been looking at is if AI is going to be one of the sort of determining technologies of the 21st century, we can dispute this or not, but like take that as your baseline assumption, is our educational system fit for purpose to train the next generation of technologists? I think Britain right now is kind of an accidental leader in AI or an unintentional leader in AI, along with a lot of other countries, just because of the evolution of that particular technology. But now that people are very aware of its potential, both for good and bad, there's a lot of national strategies and corporate strategies that we're seeing 
happening around the world. Is that feeding down though into primary education, secondary education, parents and teachers knowing what to talk to children about, are children thinking about how to, how to work in this or not? And you, know, you could take this even to just the media when you turn on your lovely BBC, are you looking at shows that are helping to build the national consciousness, mm -hmm. kind of like the way we build public health consciousness or financial awareness? And then if you go and look at our lawmakers and see what they're debating, there's like the AI all party parliamentary group, mm -hmm. um, which I've had the pleasure of talking to and presented my book to in July. That's great, but it's like a self-selecting group of lawmakers mm -hmm. who are very busy and have a full docket of other concerns. Are the rest of the MPs just kind of checked out because they're focused on other stuff? So whose job is it to be looking at the strategic direction of cultivating talent for a country, mm -hmm. for the globe, mm -hmm. <laughs> because we've got a tiny problem called climate change, which may make all of this conversation totally irrelevant if we incinerate ourselves within 100 years. So there's that question of you know, who's, who's doing the talent pipeline cultivation, who's doing the, the strategic role and opening it up so that it isn't just for self-selecting people who were like, oh, I was taking radios apart since I was you know, five mm -hmm. and interested in tech. How do you reach out to people who think tech isn't for them mm -hmm. to say, we absolutely want you in, even if you're not working in it, you're going to be working with it and it will be working on you or worked on you. Right. Well, that's what I love about your book. So Stephanie has a book. You should go buy it. Um, <laughs> if you flip it over, you'll see a very nice comment from me about it. Well, but that is what I love about your book, right? It is understandable mm. um, by so many people. And I think what you're tapping into is this critical need to incorporate technology at like, where people are, right? And, and it is not that everybody needs to take a class in programming. Everyone does not need to know five or six different programming languages. Um, you should be able to interact with technology as it is relevant to your life, right? And, it, and again, I think that is something that you emphasize in your book and in, in different components of it. And in particular, when we think about education, it's actually very fascinating. I have a, I have a love-hate relationship with a lot of this sort of AI education. Um, so I do sit on the board of AI for All, and I really love how AI for All um, does you know, workshops and uh, programs, um, in particular for young women who are interested in entering the field. Um, cynically, I sometimes think, and by the way, like that is a very, very well-funded Right, like not just AI for all, but like any sort of you know uh, STEM pipeline resolving problem is incredibly well funded and largely from these tech dinosaurs. Right, then you have to ask why. Right, so if you know Amazon builds a machine learning model to help them hire people, and it the one of the first things it learns is that any resume from a woman should be rejected, and it learns that because Amazon almost explicitly hires men then why on earth are all of these companies then spending all this money? If I'm to be cynical, I would say, well, it's because um, they, it's, they don't have to deal with the problem. Because one thing that I do not see funding for are women in tech who are currently in tech and have jobs who do things like hit a glass ceiling, hit harassment, um, you know, are told that they should smile more or be softer or, you know, that guy is a 10x engineer, you should actually help coach him to be a better leader, etc. I do not see programs around that because mm -hmm. it requires tech companies to face difficult truths. So that's my cynical take. My less cynical take is uh, I do think that there is more of a demand and, and a right, and this demand is, is uh, absolutely correct, you know, to have more people included and understanding how technology is being built, right? So a couple of years ago, the big narrative was about black boxes, right? And we had all of these companies pop up around explainable AI. And really what happened was they realized it was a bunch of very, very smart people making very, very technical approaches about technical things that had very technical outcomes. And everybody realized that nobody wanted explainable AI because there was nothing we could do with it. But what we actually need are better ways of interacting, better ways of engaging, um, so that's why an audience like this, full of very brilliant, multi-talented people, is absolutely necessary in tech. You know, you'd mentioned the monoculture. I mean, I have never seen a monoculture like I've seen in Silicon Valley, ideologically, aesthetically, <laughs> in every way possible. Um, I live in Texas now, and I am grateful to live in a place that's actually more diverse than San Francisco. Um, and I know probably, like, maybe folks as audience, are, you know, have 
know a lot of the stereotypes about Texas, and certainly a lot of them are true, but I will say literally my neighborhood, I live outside of Houston, Texas, um, in this little town called Katy, literally my neighborhood has more diversity in terms of income, race, age, uh, you know, any demographic you could possibly think of than I ha ever had living in Silicon Valley. Gosh, that's food for thought. Um, and it, it's funny, um, on my way here, I was reading a book called The Story of Art Without Men by Katie Hessel, uh, which is a beautiful art history book. And I was enjoying it so much that I missed my stop and ended south of the river and had to come back. So it's a great recommendation for this book. <laughs> One of the things I was thinking while reading it was how in the history of art, which is a great place to go if you're ever feeling a bit jammed and need to get unstuck um, and refresh your tired technologist brain, so many different places have become centers for innovation throughout history. Mm -hmm. And some of them, you know, so Paris obviously is the one we might think of, New York, mm -hmm. we're in one London, but it might be like St. Ives in Cornwall, or it might just be a moment, you know, German expressionism, it sort of, it will rise and then it will sort of ebb and flow. We'll look at something as a historical phenomenon versus something that is still living. I think we could say New York is still an art hub today. Um, is Paris as much? Maybe, I don't know, and, you know, discuss. So that's the, the thing is like innovation centers move mm -hmm. around throughout human history. Some, some seem to like last the course longer. Mm -hmm. Others have moments where they rise and fall, um, kind of like Athens and Rome, etc. What are we looking at now in terms of places for innovation mm -hmm. and places where mm -hmm. you're like, okay, if Silicon Valley is kind of like a dead monoculture, I'm getting a visual of like a coral reef dying under the sea. <laughs> First of all, is that true? Second, where are you seeing those innovation hubs so that these good people who are in this audience will sort of leave being like, ha, oh, I shall mm -hmm. make like a homing pigeon for here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where shall they go? Um, and this is where I actually get very optimistic around the future of tech. Um, so as I mentioned, like this new wave of companies is really built around kind of, you know, open source, moving to product, et cetera. Um, and I think what Silicon Valley actually is seeing is the decentralization they claim they want, but are actually very afraid of. So what technology should be doing, and I think we are starting to see it more now, is enable anyone anywhere in the world to be engaged in it. So it's not even about physical spaces, it is now equally about digital spaces. Um, so I'm always very excited to see online communities uh, and you know frankly that was that was the internet right? right the internet we were just talking earlier we started off talking about how we know each other from twitter right online communities and online spaces where people can meet each other is actually the ultimate essentially frictionless way and and low expense way for people who can't afford to move themselves to another city etc um to take part in, in everything that's happening. So actually the thing that got me into data science and into tech and what I thought I was going to do was ed tech. Mm -hmm. um, because I thought the idea of freely available education to everybody everywhere was literally one of the most beautiful things I'd ever heard. And unfortunately what ed tech has become is a massive surveillance, pun a punitive surveillance state. And nothing breaks my heart more than to see the promise of ed tech and the realization of ed tech. But that is not to say that there is not, I mean, you can learn anything on the internet, right? You can uh, hear anybody speak, you can pick up any skill. I think that's really beautiful. So in terms of like where are centers of innovation? So one answer is the entire internet is a center of innovation. You can learn whatever you want. I think that's amazing and beautiful. You can meet amazing people. Um, that barrier to introduction and the barrier to entry to talk to famous people or people you admire is is quite, you know, is declined. But the other thing is, I am seeing so much wonderful innovation all over the world. Um, you know, in my time at Accenture, I had the privilege of being able to go everywhere. And, and you know, I, I, I really saw like the same basic beautiful characteristics in all of these centers of innovation. Number one is you get very multidisciplinary people. Number two, you get people with all sorts of different backgrounds. Number three, you're tapping into this creative imaginary energy um, to number four, answer problems that these people have, right? So a lot of the critiques of Silicon Valley, which are absolutely correct, are, you know, they're solving their own problems. And in a sense, that's fine because everybody has their lived experience. But 
they shouldn't be solving other people's problems. Other people should be enabled to solve their own problems. And that's been the problem, right? They've centralized wealth, they've centralized authority, they've sent for all their narratives of decentralization and openness. All they have done is become a center of everything. Mm. And we're now pulling it out from there. Um, so the, the example I actually give um, about you know solving your own problems is um, I was in Norway and I was there to give a talk and it was like you know January, so of course it was very cold. And I was, you know, using maps on my cell phone to get to where I was going. And I was sitting there and watching as my phone battery quickly went to zero. And I didn't understand what was happening. So I finally got to where I was going. And I'm like, oh, my God, something's wrong with my phone. And they all laugh. And they're like, oh, no, no, this happens. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, oh, well, in really cold temperatures, your phone battery dies. And I'm like, and I have an iPhone. So I'm like, Apple hasn't solved this problem. Because that to me seems like some sort of like a tech problem. You throw, and not to be flippant, but it does seem like a problem that maybe you can throw some engineers behind. But what I realized is Cupertino, California literally never has this problem. There is not a single person in Cupertino, California who's like, ooh, it's sub zero, my phone is bricking. They have never faced this problem. And instead of actually fixing a problem that, you know, a significant part of the world has, that there are many parts of the world that are very, very cold. They do things like make a, make a watch that knows my swim stroke because that's a problem they face in Cupertino, <laughs> California. My goodness, am I doing butterfly or freestyle? <laughs> Got to make sure my trainer knows. Meanwhile, there is, there is some insignificant, uh, sorry, uh, uh, some significant part of the world whose phones literally do not work three months out of the year. Um, but, and, and again, that is fine but then give resources, education, authority, and power so that people can solve their own problems. Wow, I love that. Uh, without, thank you very much, without further ado, I'm gonna give you all the resource of time um, to solve your problems. You have, you know, the stage is open for Q&A. You can ask Rumam anything you like. Um, myself, maybe. I'll answer Definitely if I Definitely ask Stephanie it. questions. <laughs> um, so let's, let's go for it and open it up, but thank you so much. And it's no holds barred, like, ask away, you, you we're ready. You can ask yeah. us anything. That's the only reason the we even agreed to better. come here, was like, we want real questions. Yes, the wilder the better. Get uncomfortable. <laughs> so um, I work for one of those tech giants that is building things for people, like, you know, that are around and people who have that problem and people who have that power. And I always thought, okay, I want to be in this space so that I can be not the archetype of the space. Mm -hmm. But I'm finding that I actually don't know how to channel the problems of everyone else into that space, if that makes sense. So what would be your advice in terms of, you know, actually getting the data from the world and actually feeding it into that environment? Because obviously longer term, maybe we want to um, have more forums where it's more accessible, where that where everyone has an equal say. But right now we don't have that. So what can we do in the short term mm -hmm. to create a funnel for people, for those views of people who might be more not don't have access to that space to actually have a say in that space? Because obviously people who work there have a voice to be able to do that. Yeah, that's a great question. So if I were to sort of rephrase, it's you know if you are somebody on the inside. Um, how do you then curate those voices and that feedback so that you know you can be improving what you're working on, what you're building? And to be perfectly honest, like I don't think that's a solved problem. So what I would say is one end of it is when a lot of the narrative started about greater inclusion of marginalized communities, what we saw was a lot of like really fun design-led thinking sessions, lots of colorful sticky notes, bad sandwiches, etc. And everybody had a bunch of feel-good moments, and then product team went and built product, like quite literally. And then maybe afterwards, when something breaks, they're getting like community feedback, and people are like, hey, this thing's terrible. They're like, oh, oops, sorry. And they're kind of putting Band-Aids on things. So it's not really a sustainable way to build product. Um, and what you're tapping into is literally why I've created the, not, the algorithmic bias bounty nonprofit. So what, what we want to do is take uh, fundamental questions of how machine learning models are built and engage the community in giving us feedback. So our first challenge is actually quite technical. We are asking folks to address the issue of data set bias by making better image tagging models. So it is actually a very 
it is a very narrow question, but a really important one because so much of downstream biases in AI and machine learning models come from biased data sets. One thing we are working on, and actually this is like related to your question, are no code bounties. So how do you engage subject matter experts who are not programmers in, con in constructive critique and constructive feedback? Um, and what I'm seeing is that there is actually a big demand at companies uh, to engage in these bounty programs. So what I'll say is, you know, not everybody wants their dirty laundry aired, and that's fine. So companies want to do private bounty programs. So what, what we're doing with a nonprofit um, is engaging communities around the world and being the liaison between those and companies in order to give them, you know, to give both, and frankly, both groups access to each other. I think sometimes, you know, uh, the privilege and the, the cocoon of technology and the monoculture actually does kind of make it difficult to know even who to reach out to if you are looking for a community that's an expert on something. Uh, and that's the gap we're hoping to fill. There's a couple of reasons, and I have different opinions on why this may be better off living outside of a company, not necessarily inside of a company. And it has more to do with, you know, if we are trying to engage in critique, then you, like, you, you shouldn't design the test that you take and then you grade, right? Um, and that's kind of the paradigm we're challenging. But it is actually quite difficult because, you know, back to, you know, culture and community and communication, these worlds all speak very differently and bridging communication styles while respecting both. Because what I will say is tech understands that non-tech people don't speak their language. They look down on them. And that is not the correct way. It's not that everyone should learn tech jargon or, or know what a KPI is or whatever. It's actually that we have to treat this like I'm translating English into French and French into English. So how do I translate what this community is prioritizing in their language to what this other community is building in their language. Um, and some very specific examples actually is, you know, there have been a couple of uh, indigenous movements in tech to structure and build their own data sets. And what, and there's a really amazing one out of uh, the Pacific Northwest in Canada, another one out of New Zealand. And the fundamental reason for this is indigenous communities saying, we don't structure and communicate our thoughts the way you do. So when you create a data set, you are assuming Everyone thinks in the same structure you do, but we do this. We do this differently. So let us build it. So it's been—it's just such a fascinating educational exercise. And again, back to like I think it was your second question about should non-tech, non-engineers be in the room? Like absolutely, right? Because you need people to explain people to other people. They might even have really useful ideas. God forbid. <laughs> Maybe even better ideas. No. Stop. Impossible. <laughs> Next question. So we need to shut this down. <laughs> uh, hi, um, my name is Daniel. I'm doing my DFL looking at AI's use in Facebook. Um, thank you so much for your talk today. It was really interesting. Uh, it seems pretty clear to me that Elon's massively overstepped in the way that he has treated both yourself but also your team. And the importance of ethics and transparency are very clear. At the same time, I've noticed um, you know, some of in his, in his public st statements around Twitter's um, losses in terms of it's losing a lot of money every day. I know Jack Dorsey came out and said he apologized to staff for, as he's put it, growing very quickly. And this is obviously a challenge many tech companies are facing given the economic environment and potentially some might say um, significant overvaluations. In that context, I'm wondering if you have any reflections on what a more sustainable steady state would be when it mm -hmm. comes to ethics and transparency given companies have a lot of pressures. So do you have any thoughts on proxies for how many, how much, what percentage of resources they should spend mm -hmm. on ethics and transparency? Mm -hmm. And how do you weigh that against competing economic obje objectives? And I really love your question for many reasons. And one of them is that I am actually one of the few people who believes that we can merge. So we can, and I, I suppose the nonprofit way to say it, say it is, um, uh, do good and do well, is that what it is? Mm -hmm. Right, so like doing the right thing should not be at odds with living a good life, right? Like um, the, the, one of the biggest myths you are told is that if you are doing work that is for the social good, it's somehow better or okay and you're more pure if you're poor. That is like just a fundamental, a fundamental flaw 
in a lot of these structures. So the flip side is, and I think this is getting at your question, is, well, if you are going to make a successful business and you can't think about the ethics stuff because it's a loss center or it slows you down. So the other thing I have is an investment fund in responsible innovation. And what I am doing is actually investing in companies. And But this is from you know my background as somebody who builds products. Like I'm I am actually not necessarily a researcher in this field by background. My job has always been to merge moral imperatives in a capitalistic incentive dynamic, which is like a very difficult problem, but a challenge I will accept. So we invest in companies that I view as building a responsible innovation infrastructure. So the first thing I'll say is no company can scale and grow without addressing the problems of negative externalities. So one is rather than companies viewing these as a loss center, the fundamental problem is how companies are incentivized and it goes back to them having to deliver revenue quarter over quarter. Right? So there is no good long-term way in which we measure value. I'm not the first person to say this. Right, So the CEO of Panera literally left Panera because he's like, I want to make a company that is successful and sustainable and good for people in the long term. And I'm just getting pressure to like, and this is like unrelated to tech, right? He, he would get pressure to sell soft drinks because uh, you know food establishments make a huge amount of profit from soft drinks. It costs them a half a penny to make a Coke that they sell for like $3. But he did not want to because he wanted to sell more healthy food. And that's just the example of that tension. From a tech perspective, it's something like the move fast and break things dynamic and oh, like the, you know, there's gonna be competition, someone's gonna get there first and don't worry about the ethics stuff. So there's a fundamental flaw actually going back in the incentive structures for companies um, and again, I think there's actually a lot of people thinking about this, but that's also where you get all these really fascinating investment communities, right? And you know, not just, and I believe my fund is the very first one to think about responsible innovation as product and not as ESG, so like more of the sustainability aspect of things. I treat it like a fundamental need in how companies are being built. So I think that's one, so, so part one is shifting how we think about the value of companies to not just value quarter over quarter revenue. Uh, that requires teams like my former team and other teams to find different ways of measuring value. Um, that is one thing that my team was working on. Uh, we were creating metrics around inequality, addictive use, content variety that we actually viewed as analogs to the traditional core metrics of monetizable daily active users, revenue, minutes on platform. So one is creating different ways to measure this value, and two is elevating those metrics to the level of things like revenue so that the downstream impact is the way a company is incentivized shifts from simply revenue production, right? So why is Twitter less valuable? Well, it's because we are literally only measuring value as dollars. If we measure value in different ways, Twitter is incredibly valuable. And I think that's always been the story of Twitter, right? Like Twitter is like the little engine that could, if you remember that book when you were a child, like Twitter is successful in spite of itself. Probably the one thing I will agree with Mark Zuckerberg on is he once said Twitter is a clown car that drove into a coal mine. And I completely agree with that with all of my heart. Like I say this with so much love that there is nothing better than the community and culture of people who work at Twitter because we are so self-critical of ourselves and the company has so much heart. And that's why we never grew as big as Facebook, right? We were not that ruthless and we were okay with it and we're totally fine. So like, how do we create that world in which it is totally fine to not be pursuing ruthless amounts of growth? And actually to get back to your question, that's not how companies are incentivized today. So at the fundamental core, it's we need to re-incentivize companies. And the second part of it is I think companies are coming to a realization and the current state of Twitter is almost a, a farcical, I was saying this is almost Dadaist what's happening at Twitter. It is like an extreme example of, you know, what if we took this idea of you don't need ethics and moderation and any of those people and literally took it to a comical extreme? It is, it is an almost Dadaist artistic example of what happens. Um, so I hope that one lesson taken away from all of Twitter and everything happening is that these teams are not loss centers. They are literally critical for core business functions. Great We've got question. time Thank for you. one last question if anyone wants to get hand. it in. I see two hands now. Hello? Oh, is there time? Okay. 
Hi, I'm behind the podium. Oh, uh, okay. Hello. <laughs> um, thanks so much. I was going to ask his question because um, it's excellent and a good lead up. Um, but based on what you just said, um, okay, o obviously since tech has changed a lot in the past year and there might not be the same amount of funding for these so-called extra teams, right, to actually make the tech uh, work the way we want it to. Um, I'm really excited by open source efforts and it does feel um, that a lot of these algorithms, whether it's content recommendation, ad recommendation, um, image identification, things like that, they're kind of too influential to leave up to small teams at individual companies. It seems like too much responsibility um, to give to, especially when they're in a company that has other interests as well. Do you see perhaps in five years, 10 years, that there's a future where these are essentially a, a digital public good that we have like a recommend, let's say a set of 10 recommender systems that are optimized for different things. They're regulated, people can test them. And then let's say any company, it doesn't have to be some of these larger kind of monopolies, but it could be anyone who wants to build an app that needs a recommender system can then use that one that's approved. Is that something from your experience actually on practically working in these companies, do you think that's reasonable at all or is that just, you know, a dream? Yeah, so I think kind of like one version of what you're talking about is what Jack Dorsey had put forth as algorithmic choice, which actually my team was working on. Um, so this idea of how do we build essentially a marketplace for machine learning models. And I feel like this clock is telling me we're out of time. But I have so many thoughts on this. So number one is it actually just pushes a lot of those problems upstream. So if like, so let's say the adopting Jack Dorsey's definition of algorithmic choice, it's essentially an app store for machine learning models, right? So the same way you have a phone and there are 10 different apps you can use to annotate PDFs, you kind of just like pick one. Um, or you look at the one that has the best reviews, it'd be kind of a similar concept. But a couple of thoughts slash concerns is, like I said, then, then all of the content moderation problems, um, ethical problems simply move upstream. Because the first thing that would happen is uh, Breitbart is knocking on our door saying, we want to make a model. You know, like a Nazi party is saying, we'd like to make a model, thank you. Uh, and then now we have every content moderation problem we have on social media trying to address specific hate accounts at scale, because now they are building models for this. So that's kind of one extreme of the concern. But then you're like, oh, what if it's regulated? Sure, but then what if it's India or China? So you know, I, I'm, I'm always wary of pushing the problems by saying government will resolve it, because as we have seen at a global nature, we cannot necessarily, I mean, frankly, it's not even India or China. What if it's the US government under Trump, right? So the regulators are not necessarily going to be, they're not arbiters of truth or justice, right? They are also political actors. Um, but you started off by saying open source. So I'm always very fascinated by the culture of open source communities. And it's not that open source has solved this problem by any means. They certainly have not. But it is so interesting to see cultural norms arise, community-based standards, right? So the culture of open source is the culture of data science. That's why artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science has really skyrocketed over the past like decade or so is, is actually because so much of this information is made freely available. Anybody can learn to, to program a machine learning model if you have a, a decently operable computer and a Wi-Fi connection. And that's been very powerful. So it's, I think we have an interesting analog on what community norms, moderation, et cetera, mean um, by simply looking at the open source community. So I suppose, like, and like, I, like I said, we're out of time and I have so many more thoughts on what, what you're saying, but it introduces a new set of problems that are actually the old problems dressed up slightly differently, but it is a very fascinating thing to think about. So like I said, I'm, I'm very excited now about these new wave of companies that are kind of building in the open. So let's start exploring what that means to get better engagement for people and building better ethical tech um, and also understanding the value of these teams in companies as one, like one member of an ecosystem of individuals and groups and organizations whose job it is to constructively critique technology. I wish we had more time. I'm sure I speak for everybody in this room. Thank you so much for, Thank you, for your Stephanie. thoughts.